If you're a bit older than you'd like to admit, you probably remember this thing. The original Lights Out game from 1995. Basically a grid of buttons and some initial light pattern, connected up, down, left, right. Anytime you press a button, it switches the light for that button and all the neighboring buttons. The goal is to get all the lights out. And I remember wondering as a kid, could you always win for any starting pattern? And the answer was no. Like if you started like this, you could press buttons for the rest of your life and you'd never win. Today I'd like to discuss a slightly different game called Lamplighter, where you start with a bunch of lamps that are initially off and you have to turn them all on. But here's the catch. You can start with any crazy pattern you want. It doesn't matter what it is. And the amazing thing is, with Lamplighter, there is always a solution. And today I'm gonna show you an amazing proof that that's the case. First, let's lay some ground rules. Unlike Lights Out, in Lamplighter, all lamps start with their initial state being off. Then like Lights Out, lamps have to switch themselves, not just their neighbors, and neighbors have to apply to each other. If A is a neighbor of B, then B is a neighbor of A. To understand why these conditions are important, let's break them and see what happens. If some lamps are initially on, you'll never solve this configuration because anything you do will always leave one lamp on and one lamp off. If you have lamps that switch only their neighbors, you'll never be able to solve this, but maybe that's a cheap shot. So look at this case. You're either gonna increase the number of lamps on by two, not change the number of lamps on, or decrease the number of lamps on by two, so you'll never have three lamps on. And if neighbors could apply in different directions, same problem. Two more lamps on, the same number of lamps on, or two less lamps on. And this is pretty amazing. The moment we break any of these three conditions, we immediately find very simple counterexamples that show that not every setup is solvable. But once all these conditions are true, we can show that we can solve every single case. What's more impressive, the proof is very accessible. You need very little prior knowledge. Just remember your basic deductive reasoning, like if it's snowing outside and snow means it's cold, it must be cold outside, even numbers and odd numbers, and patience. If you have to stop or rewind, that's completely normal. We're going to take these simple ideas and build some more complex ones. Let's take our basic reasoning and build some deductive power tools. First is induction, which is a clever way to chain implications. Next is exhaustion, where we'll examine ways to break a problem into cases and exhaust all of them. And then we're going to use these power tools to show that for any lamplighter setup, we can construct a solution. To understand induction, let's say one day you wake up at home, soon you need to get to school, after which you'll go to the bank for some cash, and then to the store to buy your friend a present, and so on. You might wonder how you're going to get everywhere, which is easy if you have a car, but let's say you don't. Your thought process might be something like, well, I take the bus from home to school, I can walk from the bank to the store, and I guess I could ask a friend at school for a ride to the bank. Combined with the fact that you can get home because, well, you are home, you know that this will get you everywhere. But why do we think this way? It's true that it works, but why is it so useful? Well, if I just asked you how you're going to get to the store without any other context, it's a difficult question. All you know is that you're home. Of what relevance is the store? But if I ask how you're going to get from the bank to the store, the question is much easier because you get to assume you're already at the bank. It doesn't matter if it's true or if it will ever be true. And that's how it works for every implication. Assume the preceding fact is true and to prove the implication, show that it leads to the next fact. Combined with an initial seed of something true, you can chain these implications to prove every case on its own. And this is what's so great about induction. I just show that some fact is true for an initial case, and then I show that if it's true for any case, it implies the next one. So let's say something is true for the number 42, and then I just have a bunch of implications. I get to assume these preceding facts are true, and I just have to show that they'll lead to the next case being true, and then I've proven the fact for everything 42 and on. I've seen many analogies for this, like toppling dominoes or a train with an engine for the initial case, and these are fine analogies for why induction works, but I want to present an analogy for how it's used. Let's say you want a credit line. First you apply to establish some basic credibility, then you get credit to assume whatever you want, and you pay off your debt by proving the next case. Otherwise, the mathematical repo men come and invalidate your assumptions. Let's see this in action by proving that if I add up an odd amount of odd numbers, I get an odd number. Get out that card and go for it. First of all, obviously adding up one odd number gives you an odd number. Next, let's assume this is true for any odd amount of odd numbers and show that it will be true for the next amount when we add two more numbers. We substitute our assumption to what we're trying to prove and voila, all we have to show is that the sum of three odd numbers is odd. Think about this starting from our initial case and you'll see why it works. Now we just show that adding two odd numbers, whether one negative and one positive, or both the same sign, we get an even number. Then adding an odd number to that even number results in an odd number. 
and we are done with our proof. Now let's take a look at exhaustion. Let's say you wake up again, can't find your backpack. You know that in your house you have a main entry room, a bedroom, a kitchen, and a bathroom. And you look through each one and you can't find your backpack. Clearly you've exhausted all cases so it's not in your house. But you were lucky because you knew all the individual cases. Not always for every problem do we know how to break it up into cases. Sometimes we have to get a bit tricky. If you've ever seen a magician do a trick with books, oftentimes he has one gimmick book but wants to give the illusion of choice. So he asks an audience member to pick a book. If he picks this one, great. If not, the magician says, okay, let's get rid of that one and have another audience member pick. If she picks this one, then great, we'll get rid of it. And if this one, then okay, let's use that. This strategy is called magician's choice and we can use something like it to dynamically drive cases towards a desired proof. Let's see an example. I want to prove that multiplying a number by the one immediately following it will always result in an even number. First of all, notice that if I multiply an even number by absolutely any other number whatsoever, the result is always going to be even. But I don't know anything about my two numbers, so let's ask an audience member. Is the first one even or odd? If he says even, then we're done. If he says odd, then we observe that the next number must be even, so we say, let's not use that one, and we're still done. And now on to our main proof, where we're going to show that for any lamplighter setup, there's always a solution. Let's take out our card and prove an initial case. We could do one lamp, but it's even simpler to just say that we have no lamps and we do nothing, which sounds weird, but that's technically a valid setup and solution. So now we have our credit line, which means we can choose a lamp, exclude it, and assume the remaining game is solvable. And we could do this for any lamp. Let's call this a minus one game. We could then ask what would have happened to this lamp if we had left this lamp attached while we solved the minus one game. And this too can be asked for any lamp. But now uh, we don't know what would happen to a given excluded lamp. It's time for some magic. We don't know what will happen to a given lamp if we exclude it, leave it attached, and solve its minus one game. But let's assume there is some lamp that doing so would leave it lit at the end. Then all the lamps are lit at the end, and we're done. If not, we have an amazing property. Any lamp that we exclude and solve its minus one game will remain off at the end. I find this absolutely mind-blowing. We haven't discovered any special properties or done any analysis at all. Just by navigating towards our desired proof with the sheer power of assumption, we've shown that all we need to prove that there's always a solution to lamplighter is to prove that there's a solution in this extremely particular case where all minus one games leave the excluded lamp off. Let's look at such a case. In this example, the minus one game that excludes any lamp is solved by switching the lamp in the opposite corner. Let's overlap all these solutions and count how many times each lamp is switched. Bottom left, top left, top right, bottom right. Notice how each lamp is switched three times, which in theory should leave it lit, because any lamp that's switched an odd number of times will be lit. We could have even switched the bottom right three times and it wouldn't really change anything in terms of the switch counts being odd. Let's see this overlap strategy in action by going around the game clockwise. Order shouldn't really matter though, since we're basically adding ones, and it works. But what would this look like more generically? Notice that when this lamp is excluded and we solve its minus one game, all the other lamps are switched. So when any other lamp is excluded, this lamp is switched. So if there are an even number of lamps, from the perspective of an individual lamp, it will get switched one less time, which is odd, and therefore it will be lit at the end, and this holds for every individual lamp. If there are an odd number of lamps, however, each individual lamp is switched an even number of times, so it remains off at the end, and this overlap strategy brings us to the initial state where all lamps were off. So for even games, we're all set. For odd games, we're still in the dark. Since we like even games and not odd games, let's split our odd games into an even section and an odd section. Then we go through our beloved minus one game overlap strategy for the lamps in the even section. At the end, each lamp in the even section is switched an odd number of times, so it's lit. The lamps in the odd section were never excluded for a minus one game, so they're all switched an even number of times and still remain off. If we can now just light all the lamps in the odd section without disturbing the lamps in the even section, we're done. But how do we do that? The good news is that we choose how to split the sections. It could split like this, like this, like this. It's totally up to us. So how about we pick a lamp that has an even number of neighbors and we declare that lamp and its neighbors to be the odd section and the rest the even section. Then we go through the strategy we just discussed and now we just switch the lamp that we chose and we are done. Just one question remains. Can we always find a lamp with an even number of neighbors? Hmm. Are we in trouble or do we need to remember some tricks? 
Recall how we broke down our cases. We show that we only care about very specific types of games. And in those specific types of games, whenever we have an even number of lamps, we're good. So we only care about proving this for when we have an odd number of lamps. So let's rephrase our question. If we have an odd number of lamps, can we always find some lamp with an even number of neighbors? Let's label any place where a lamp touches a line with a little blue dot. Now let's ask, how many blue dots are there? One way to count them is by adding up the total number of neighbors from each lamp. The other way to count them is by noticing that each line has exactly two blue dots, so we just multiply the number of lines by two. Since this is clearly even, the total number of neighbors must also be even. But recall that the sum of an odd amount of odd numbers is odd, so there must be some lamp that has an even number of neighbors. And with that, we've exhausted all possibilities and we conclude our proof. Now, let's do a victory lap by solving an odd example. For this setup, any minus one game is solved by switching the two lamps adjacent to the excluded lamp. But since this is an odd game, we first pick some lamp with an even number of neighbors, where in this case any lamp will do, and we declare that lamp and its neighbors to be the odd section. We now overlap the solutions to the minus one games for just the lamps from the even section, and in the end, we see the even section lit and the odd section dark exactly as expected. We now just have to light the odd section by switching our selected lamp, but let's really savor this victory. Remember those conditions from the beginning? Look at this. Let's say not all lamps are initially off. Then we do not have a solution. Or let's say that lamps do not switch themselves. No solution. Or let's say that neighbors don't apply mutually. No solution. It's precisely these three conditions that allow this step to be correct. Now we slay the beast, and my is that satisfying. Question, do you think this means that for even games, we can always find the solution whether or not these conditions are true? Let me know what you think in the comments. I'd like to wrap up with some food for thought. If you like this kind of mathematical reasoning that doesn't rely heavily on symbols, terms, and algebras, you might want to look into graph theory, which examines these kinds of linked structures. It's useful in countless ways and doesn't require significant mathematical background. At the same time, there's a bridge from graph theory to another part of math called linear algebra. For example, we could have labeled the lamps in the lamplighter game and created what's called an adjacency matrix for the lamps, where if two lamps are adjacent, we place a 1, and if not, we place a 0. We would also say each lamp is its own neighbor, since that just means it lights itself. Then if we multiply by some vector where each number represents the number of times we touch each lamp, the resulting vector will tell us how many times each lamp has been switched. But remember how lamps only care about whether they've been switched an odd or even number of times? We could actually look at this whole problem in Z2, which is basically a number system where math is the same, but we only care about a number's remainder when divided by 2, meaning whether it's odd or even. Then in general, we could have rephrased this whole problem as whether this equation has a solution for certain kinds of adjacency matrices. Why would we do this? While our proof demonstrates a way to solve any lamplighter game, that way is not necessarily very efficient. If we started a game with 200 lamps, we'd first have to solve every minus one game with 199, and for each of those, every minus one game with 198, and so on. With matrices, we could use known linear algebra tricks to get solutions much faster. But linear algebra and Z2 are topics for another day. Speaking of which, if you're interested in linear algebra, check out the amazing essence of linear algebra series from 3Blue1Brown, who I'd like to thank for the encouragement to make this channel in this video. If it's something people like, I'd be happy to continue. Finally, I would just like to say that I think every person is like a lamp, a potentially untapped massive beacon of excitement for learning, sharing, helping, and connecting. Tap into your own lamp and the many lamps around you. Even starting from total darkness, you can make a world of difference.